Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We have talked about the artwork and other objects that have come to be known as the Benin Bronzes on several installments of Unearthed, including our most recent one. We also mentioned these pieces briefly at the end of our two-parter on Lord Elgin and the Parthenon marbles. Uh, We have not talked in detail, though, about how these cultural objects and works of art were taken from the Kingdom of Benin in Western Africa in the first place. This happened in 1897 in what's typically described as a punitive raid or punitive expedition by the British. This was in an area that is part of Edo State in Nigeria today. The most visible calls for the return of the Benin Bronzes started in the 1970s, and they've really escalated over the past decade or so. In the last few years, some nations and institutions have committed to returning these pieces, but only a few have actually been returned at this point, including at least two that came from a private individual. So that is what we're going to talk about today. And just a heads up, there's a lot of heavy material in this episode, including slavery and colonialism, a lot of warfare and human sacrifice. The Kingdom of Benin was founded by the Edo people, also known as the Bini, by about the 11th century, and it's governed by the Oba and his court. This kingdom really started to flourish around the 13th century, including rebuilding the capital, which was originally named as Edo and today is known as Benin City. This capital was surrounded by ditches and earthwork walls, which also sectioned off parts of the city's interior. Although many of these walls are no longer standing, they're believed to have totaled a greater length than the Great Wall of China. Uh, According to ethno-mathematician Ron Eglash, author of African Fractals, The city was laid out as a fractal in a pattern that was repeated on a smaller scale within compounds and then individual houses and then rooms. He's widely quoted as saying that Europeans who first encountered this type of planning found it chaotic and disorganized, not realizing the underlying pattern that was involved. But that is really not how early visitors to the Kingdom of Benin described the capital, Multiple European accounts from the 16th through the 18th centuries describe the city and its palaces as impressive and orderly with comparisons to various cities in Europe. Dutch Dr. Ulfert Dapper described the compound housing the king's court as, quote, easily as big as the town of Harlem in 1668. As another example, in 1691, Portuguese captain Lorenzo Pinto wrote, Quote, Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eye can see. The houses are large, especially that of the king, which is richly decorated and has fine columns. The city is wealthy and industrious. It is so well governed that theft is unknown and the people live in such security that they have no doors to their houses. The Portuguese had been the first Europeans to make contact with the Kingdom of Benin, and the two nations started a trading relationship with Portugal establishing an embassy at the Oba's court and Benin sending ambassadors to Portugal as well. Benin became wealthier through its trade with Portugal, with Benin's exports including gold, paper, ivory, fabric, animal skins, and palm oil. Benin had a guild system for artists and craftspeople who worked in materials like ivory, wood, and brass. Although this artwork and the techniques used to produce it were developed before contact with Europeans, they really flourished thanks to Portugal's use of brass as a trade good. The kingdom's artists used lost wax casting methods to make brass plaques detailing the kingdom's history, as well as life-size heads of leaders, ancestors, and historical figures. Eventually, Benin's exports to Europe and its colonies included enslaved people. This was a smaller part of Benin's economy than that of many other kingdoms, including Dahomey, which we've covered on the show previously. Captain John Adams, who was in the area between 1786 and 1800, noted that ivory was a more important part of Benin's trade— 
One of the likely reasons for Benin's comparatively smaller involvement in the slave trade is that the Oba outlawed the enslavement and sale of males in the early 19th century, and there wasn't as much demand for enslaved women and girls. From the 15th through late 19th centuries, most of what Europeans knew about the Kingdom of Benin came from the writing of traders and travel writers, including British, Portuguese, and Dutch travel writers who wrote about their experiences in various parts of the kingdom. None of the people writing these accounts stayed long enough to get a thorough sense of the kingdom's history or culture. They were visitors, writing about their general impressions of the kingdom's cities and towns and its people. And if you're thinking, what about missionaries? The Christian missionaries who went to the kingdom of Benin before the 19th century didn't really establish a huge presence there. Although some people did convert to Christianity, in general, the high-ranking people, including the Oba, did not. Europeans who tried to live in this area also faced things like malaria and other diseases they didn't have any resistance to or experience with, so illnesses and deaths were really common. In general, most mission projects in Benin during this period did not last long. Eventually, Britain replaced Portugal as Benin's primary trading partner. Britain was deeply involved in the slave trade from Western Africa, and its trade with Benin included trafficking enslaved people. After Britain passed the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in 1807, it started pressuring African kingdoms and nations that it had relationships with to end their own involvement in slavery, including the Kingdom of Benin. As that happened, palm oil became an increasingly large part of Benin's exports to Britain. This was especially true as the Industrial Revolution progressed, since in addition to its use in cooking and to make soap, palm oil was used as an industrial lubricant. By the late 19th century, two things were happening that dramatically affected Britain's relationship with Benin. The first was Benin's approach to trade. The Oba had a monopoly on all trade, most of it conducted through the port of Ugotan, also known as Guato. Anyone trading at the market paid tribute to the Oba, and the Oba controlled what was available. If people were not paying tribute or were otherwise breaking trade agreements they had with the Oba, then the Oba could shut down the market entirely. So as Britain became increasingly reliant on palm oil and also wanted more access to Benin's other trade goods, merchants and traders became increasingly frustrated by the Oba's restrictions. For example, a Mr. Brownridge, who was an agent for a merchant company, wrote in a letter, quote, If Benin was under proper government and the resources of the country properly developed, I am firmly of the opinion that the exports would be very great. So long as the king of Benin is allowed to carry on what he is doing at present, it means simply loss to the merchants as also the protectorate. That word, protectorate, ties to the other interconnected piece of this. That was the scramble for Africa. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, European powers aggressively expanded their colonial interests and attempts to control the African continent. British consul Edward Hewitt started trying to sign treaties with various monarchs in Western Africa in 1884, including along the coast of what's now Nigeria. By that point, Britain had been involved in various parts of Africa for decades, so this was really a ramping up of its earlier involvement. Through this process, Britain claimed multiple kingdoms in West Africa under its protectorates, and at first, this mostly prevented them from making similar agreements with other European nations. But beyond that, again, at least at first, Britain was relatively hands-off. Years could pass between Britain adding a West African kingdom to one of its protectorates and Britain really taking concrete steps to control the area. Britain's activities in Africa went way beyond what was happening in West Africa, but that's really the part we're focused on here. From the European point of view, many of these claims to territory in West Africa were negotiated at the Berlin Conference, also known as the Berlin-West Africa Conference, which ran from November 15, 1884 to February 26, 1885. At this conference, European nations mapped out which of them had the strongest claims to what territory and set standards for trade among those regions. The thousands of kingdoms, nations, and ethnic groups in Africa were not part of this negotiation at all, and there were no provisions for their involvement in their own governance. 
Just in terms of the region that later became known as Nigeria, there were at least 250 different ethnic groups involved. Much of what's now Nigeria today was outlined as British territory. But in practice, Britain's influence didn't extend very far from the coast. British efforts to lay claims to the interior of the Kingdom of Benin and to secure free trading rights with the kingdom ultimately led it to pursue this punitive expedition. We will have more about that after a sponsor break. Although early European accounts of the Kingdom of Benin had described it as large, impressive, and orderly, during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the kingdom had struggled. Both the transatlantic slave trade and its abolition had affected the whole region dramatically, not just the Kingdom of Benin. So had the annexation of various African kingdoms by European powers, which we just discussed. In the Kingdom of Benin specifically, there was also a war over the Oba's line of succession that started in the mid-19th century. Throughout all of this, Benin had also been under increasing pressure from Britain to open up and expand its trade, especially its trade in palm oil. In 1892, Captain Henry Galway, Deputy Commissioner and Vice Consul of the Benin District of the Oil River Protectorate, traveled to the capital to try to get the Oba to sign a treaty with the British government. The Oba, named Ovan Ramwen, seems to have verbally agreed to sign this treaty, but once the signing ceremony actually took place, he refused to touch the pen. A member of his court reportedly signed on his behalf. There are so many different interpretations and conflicting accounts of this moment. The Oba ruled by divine right as the kingdom's sovereign and its military commander, and upon his ascension as monarch, he was also understood to embody the kingdom's whole history and heritage. But Galway has been described as rude and arrogant and either ignorant of the protocols involved with negotiating of the monarch of the kingdom of Benin or just not even considering those protocols to be something worth his notice. Some scholars have concluded that Ovan Ramwen had verbally agreed to sign the Galway Treaty when he thought it was just a simple agreement of peace and friendship. But once the signing ceremony was happening and its interpreter read its actual terms, terms that stripped the Kingdom of Benin of its sovereignty, then he refused. Opinions also differ about whether Ovan Ramwen signed the treaty through a proxy under duress or did not sign it at all. What's most clear is that Britain and Benin did not have the same understanding of this treaty and whether the Kingdom of Benin was bound to its terms. One of the treaty's provisions established free trade within the Oba's territory. But four years later, in 1896, Benin was still approaching trade as a monopoly that was entirely the Oba's prerogative, This had led to armed conflicts in some of the kingdom's more outlying villages and towns, and British officials faced increasing pressure from merchants and traders to force Benin to abide by the treaty terms. British officials, including Galway, wrote that removing the Oba would be good for British trade. Consul General Ralph Moore wrote to the Foreign Office on June 14, 1896, saying that if they were not successful in getting a better trade arrangement by the dry season, quote, an expeditionary force should be sent about January or February to remove the king and his juju men. In another letter, Moore also said that such an expedition could, quote, prevent the horrible human sacrifices and cruelties which were continually taking place therein. We will return to that idea in a bit, but Moore later went on leave. He returns to England, and James Phillips was made acting consul general in his absence. Moore had instructed Phillips to wait for his return, but instead, Phillips wrote to the Oba himself, seeking an audience. The Oba replied that he was not available. He was observing a period of seclusion and preparation leading up to the Festival of Igwe, which is the Kingdom of Benin's most important cultural and religious festival. It's one that both honors the Oba and his ancestors and blesses the kingdom. The Oba's preparation for this festival are a time of spiritual cleansing and prayer. 
Customarily, foreigners are not allowed into the Oba's presence during this preparatory period or during the festival itself. So Ovan Ramwin indicated that he would send a messenger in about a month to work at a time for Phillips and an attendant to visit. Phillips did not wait for this messenger, though. On November 16th, 1896, he wrote to the Foreign Office seeking, quote, permission to visit Benin City in February next to depose and remove the King of Benin and to establish a native council in his place and take such further steps for the opening up of the country as the occasion may require. He suggested that this expedition might pay for itself thanks to stores of ivory that he expected to find in the palace, which could be seized and sold. Phillips did not wait for a response to this either. On January 2nd, 1897, he left for Benin City with a retinue that included eight British officials, at least 200 local porters, and a pipe and drum corps. In some accounts, these porters and the pipes and drums were really hired African soldiers in disguise. This party is usually described as being unarmed, But there was also correspondence going on between various British offices during this period about what would be needed for an expedition to remove the Oba. One such letter describes 400 armed African troops, two seven-pounder guns, a Maxim, which was an early machine gun, and a rocket apparatus that belonged to the Niger Coast Protectorate Force, It's likely that at least the British officials in this expedition were provided with weapons, but it's possible that those weapons were packed in their baggage rather than being carried on their persons. As Phillips and his party approached Benin City, they were stopped and told to turn back. Again, the city was in the middle of observing its most important cultural and religious festival. When Phillips refused, the Oba's fighting force attacked, something that was done without the Oba's knowledge or approval. Phillips and most of his party were killed, and only two British officials escaped the attack. This became known as the Benin Massacre, and the British Admiralty learned about it on January 11, 1897. That was the day after it had sent word to Phillips ordering him to postpone the expedition because a large enough fighting force couldn't be raised in time to carry it out. When the Admiralty learned about this, it mounted a punitive expedition of 1,200 men under the leadership of Sir Harry Rawson. This force divided into three columns, one of them under the command of Henry Galway. They departed for Benin City on February 9, 1897, burning outlying villages and killing civilians and soldiers who resisted as they went. Armed combatants were not the only people who were killed. Eyewitnesses also described the British force firing machine guns into the bush wherever they thought people might be hiding. Once they were in the capital, the British force looted the royal palace and the Queen Mother's home and burned them. On February 21st, which was the last day of the expedition, a massive fire also destroyed many of the city's homes and buildings, Sometimes this fire is described as unintentional, but it really may have been an intentional blaze that just spread a lot farther than the British force had anticipated. Eight members of the British force are known to have been killed during this punitive expedition. The death toll among Benin's military and civilians is not really known, but it is assumed to be much, much higher. Yeah, none of the sources that I used for this episode even, like, attempted to estimate. They were not keeping track at all. They being the British force that was carrying this out. As it was looting the capital, this British force found 900 brass plaques in a warehouse. These had been removed from the palace during a remodeling. There were also life-sized brass heads depicting various monarchs and other ancestors. Other objects included brass depictions of animals, a store of ivory tusks, and various works of art and cultural objects. Members of the punitive expedition were given some of these items to keep. The rest were taken back to Britain, where about 200 were given to the British Museum, and the rest were auctioned off to pay for the expedition. It is not known exactly how many objects were taken since they were not cataloged at the time, but it is estimated to be about 3,000 works of art and other objects. The British force departed from Benin City on February 22nd. 
The Oba and his surviving court had fled, but in the days and weeks that followed, they were captured and tried. Ovan Ramwin's chiefs testified that he had never left his compound during Phillips's earlier expedition and that he had ordered that no harm come to that British force. But he was convicted and exiled to Calabar. His chiefs were sentenced to be executed. One of them took his own life while awaiting trial, and British soldiers had his body hanged outside the palace where they used it for target practice. After the punitive expedition, one subject dominated European discussions of Britain's actions in the Kingdom of Benin, and that was human sacrifice. And we're going to get into that after a sponsor break. Before James Phillips left for Benin City in early 1897, Britain's primary rationale for planning to remove the Oba was trade. Then, the punitive expedition set out to punish Benin for the deaths of Phillips and most of the rest of his party. But after the punitive expedition was over, the focus shifted to the idea that Britain needed to take control of Benin to put a stop to horrifying practices there, particularly the practice of human sacrifice. Sort of rewrote that earlier history to make it seem as though this had always been the rationale. As one example, Consul General Ralph Moore wrote to Lord Salisbury saying, quote, it is imperative that a most severe lesson be given the kings, chiefs, and juju men of all surrounding countries that white men cannot be killed with impunity and that human sacrifices with the oppression of the weak and poor must cease. This, of course, ignores the fact that the punitive expedition had killed the citizens of Benin with impunity, including the weak and poor, over the course of the punitive expedition. To contextualize this, human sacrifice was practiced in multiple nations and kingdoms in Western Africa prior to contact with Europeans. Most sacrifices were carried out to honor deities or ancestors or so the sacrificed person could carry a message to them. In some kingdoms, when a high-ranking person died, especially the Oba, Others would be sacrificed to accompany that person into the afterlife. Usually, living people would be entombed with the deceased person's body, and they were understood to have done this willingly, although societal expectations that a person would sacrifice themselves also influenced these decisions enormously. In many kingdoms, most or all of the people who did not offer themselves as sacrifices had been condemned to death for committing a crime— This was usually the case in the kingdom of Benin. In some places, prisoners of war or enslaved people were also sacrificed. Today, all of this sounds deeply and irrevocably horrifying, but the first Europeans to witness or learn about this practice did not have quite the same response because where they lived, public executions were commonplace. Portugal conducted public executions until ending executions altogether in 1846. The United Kingdom did not outlaw public execution until 1868, and the last public guillotining in France was in 1939. From the 15th through the 17th centuries, Europeans often drew a parallel between public executions in Europe and human sacrifices in parts of Africa. This was especially true when the people being sacrificed had been condemned for committing a crime. Around the 18th century, though, European attitudes toward human sacrifice started to shift. Human sacrifice then became a justification for the practice of slavery. Even though nations in Europe were still carrying out public executions, Europeans increasingly saw human sacrifice in Africa as barbaric, uncivilized, and cruel— To many Europeans, this reinforced the idea that Africans were innately inferior and therefore deserved to be enslaved. Europeans also suggested that being enslaved was a better outcome than being sacrificed. This was an idea that people expressed explicitly. In a new account of some parts of Guinea and the slave trade, William Snellgrave wrote, quote, It is evident that abundance of captives taken in war would be inhumanely destroyed. There are not an opportunity of disposing of them to the Europeans. 
so that at least many lives are saved and great numbers of useful persons kept in being. By the 19th century, as European nations started to outlaw the slave trade and the practice of slavery within their empires, more people started to view slavery itself as barbaric, but a lot of European writing about Africa continued to focus on the practice of slavery there, as well as the continuing practice of human sacrifice as evidence that Africans were inferior. Over time, human sacrifice became increasingly associated with the Kingdom of Benin specifically. European descriptions of Benin from the 19th century are nothing like those 17th century accounts that we read earlier in the show. For example, Sir Richard Burton visited Benin in 1863 and described it as a place of, quote, gratuitous barbarity which stinks of death. He also wrote a lurid and gruesome account of fetish worship and human sacrifice in the region. Western observers reported an increase in the number of sacrifices happening in Benin in the late 19th century, although it's not clear how much these reports may have been exaggerated or influenced by evolving European attitudes toward Africans as inferior and backward. To return to the punitive expedition, various colonial officials had mentioned human sacrifice in their letters before this point, and in some cases, they discussed putting a stop to it. But even in these earlier mentions, that was often ancillary to the idea of opening up trade. Knowledge of the practice of human sacrifice in Benin also hadn't gone far beyond colonial and military leadership. After the punitive expedition, though, British eyewitness accounts were horrifying, graphic, and publicly available. For example, Sir Reginald H. Bacon wrote a book about the expedition in 1879 titled Benin, the City of Blood. And in it, he wrote, quote, crucifixions, human sacrifices, and every horror the eye could get accustomed to, to a large extent, but the smells no white man's internal economy could stand. Blood was everywhere, smeared over bronzes, ivory, and even the walls. Others described the British force finding a scene of slaughter in the capital, with victims of human sacrifice scattered through the city, some of whom had been members of Philip's earlier expedition. And instead of the impressive walled streets that were so safe that people didn't feel the need for doors, there was, in the words of Captain Alan Boisregon, quote, a collection of half-ruined mud houses, not better than the huts in an ordinary native village. By the 1890s, British visitors to Benin were describing these post-expedition accounts as exaggerated. In more recent decades, some people, particularly historians and scholars from West Africa, have also put forth other explanations for what people like Reginald Bacon described. One is that many of the bodies assumed to have been victims of human sacrifice were really people who had been killed by British machine guns while hiding in the bush, whose bodies had been brought back to the capital to be buried. Another hypothesis is that the city's residents, knowing it was about to be captured by the British, intentionally defaced it to try to make it uninhabitable to them. Regardless, the accounts written by Bacon and others really painted the Kingdom of Benin as a horrific, violent place that was deserving of Britain's wrath. It influenced the way that people thought about Benin and about Africa more generally. News coverage was just effusive in its praise of British forces, and that coverage focused on the idea that Britain was freeing Benin from its own barbarism. Some of this was also threaded through with the idea that Britain needed and even deserved access to Benin's palm oil. This framing also implied that Britain deserved the artwork that had been looted from Benin during the expedition. Britain was entitled to it by virtue of being superior and as compensation for the expense involved with the invasion. After the fact, the idea of human sacrifice became a major justifying factor for all of this, for the expedition itself, for British claims to the kingdom's artistic and cultural property, and for Britain's colonial rule of the kingdom, even though what had motivated all this in the first place was first trade and then retribution for the Phillips expedition's death. As we said earlier, the artwork British forces took from Benin was not kept as one collection— Pieces were auctioned off to museums around the world. 
At first, most of the museums who bought these pieces were ethnographic museums rather than art museums. Some of this was because many ethnographic museums were actively working to expand their collections at the turn of the 20th century. But there was also implicit or sometimes explicit racism involved. Even though the objects taken out of Benin fit into European definitions of art, the fact that it was African led institutions to categorize it as ethnography. It wasn't until around the 1930s that art museums started to show an interest in the Benin bronzes as art, or started to curate them as part of their art collections rather than their ethnography collections. Although Benin had managed to retain most of its sovereignty before 1897, including after possibly signing the Galway Treaty, Britain took full control of the kingdom after the punitive expedition. Britain replaced the Oba with a system of colonial administration that involved a native council and warrant chiefs. Britain struggled to make this system work, though, and started trying to restore the monarchy with Ovan Ramwin's son, Iweka II, as a figurehead. When Ovan Ramwin died in 1914, Britain placed his son on the throne, but with the monarchy positioned as subordinate to the colonial administration. The British protectorates of northern and southern Nigeria were joined to form Nigeria in 1914 as well, and Nigeria became an independent nation on October 1, 1960. In 1963, Nigeria adopted a constitution that established itself as a republic, removing the monarchs of its many kingdoms from formal political power. Many, many kingdoms still exist today, though, with their monarchs still playing a cultural and less formalized political role. In 1977, a festival of arts and culture was being planned in Lagos, Nigeria. It had adopted an ivory pendant of Queen Idia of Benin as its emblem. The festival's planning committee asked the British Museum to loan it the 16th century mask of this queen from its collection, There are contradictory reports of what happened next. According to the British Museum, this mask was just too fragile to move, but Nigerian sources reported that the museum had required the festival to provide $3 million in insurance. This incident started to raise global awareness of the objects that had been taken out of Benin, collectively called the Benin bronzes, even though most of the items are made of brass and some are made of other materials. Efforts to repatriate at least some of the pieces have gone on for decades, and there are some real complexities involved. Like, if the bronzes are returned, who exactly should they be returned to? Most came from Benin City, specifically from the Oba's palace. So, should they be repatriated to the Oba, or to the Kingdom of Benin, or to Edo State, where Benin City is located? or to Nigeria as a nation, or to some museum or cultural institution built specifically to house these works. Such a museum is planned for Benin City, with the Benin royal family and the Nigerian government involved, but that museum has not been built yet. The Benin Dialogue Group was established in 2007 to work through these questions and other issues, and its most recent mission statement specifically references the creation of a royal museum to reunite Benin's historical artifacts, but progress toward that end has been slow. In 2018, the late Fularen Shailan published an article in Art, Antiquity, and Law titled Benin Dialogue Group, Benin Royal Museum, Three Steps Forward, Six Steps Back. One reason why progress has been slow is that there is debate about the best path forward, including from within Nigeria. And there are also people who argue that the bronzes should not be returned, at least not all of them. In 2019, while at the British Museum, Nigeria's Edo state governor, Godwin Obaseki, said, quote, These works are ambassadors. They represent who we are, and we feel we should take advantage of them to create a connection with the world. Still others feel that it's impossible to create a museum display that would really convey all the cultural and historical context of these objects. As of now, only a few pieces of artwork have been returned. Mark Walker traveled to Nigeria in 2015 to return two pieces he had inherited from his grandfather, Captain Herbert Walker, who was part of the 1897 expedition. We've discussed announcements from various universities and museums and governments that they would return the bronzes that are in their collections. We've talked about those in several installments of Unearthed, 
Some of those returns haven't happened yet, and they also represent just a fraction of the thousands of pieces that were taken. So, that is the context on all of those pieces that have come up as just a couple of sentences, summaries on unearthed episodes. Do you have listener mail to wrap us up? I do. Before we have listener mail... Uh, we just did our unearthed of the year end of 2021, and we talked about an announcement um, that uh, that Homer Plessy was going to be pardoned, uh, but the governor of Louisiana needed to sign the pardon, and that was the final step. That actually happened almost immediately after we recorded that episode. So as was planned uh, when we did that recording, um, the governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, did publicly sign the pardon of the late Homer Plessy. And there were uh, people from both the Plessy and the Ferguson families there at the ceremony. So I just wanted to, since this is the earliest opportunity, go ahead and say yes, that did happen. And then I also have an uh, email from Kelsey. Kelsey wrote to say, Thank you so much for your podcast. I first did listening years ago when I heard you did one on Frankie Manning and Lindy Hop. As a dancer myself, it was so nice to hear his story and the story of the dance I love. This email is also about a dance I love, the Pacific Northwest Ballet's Nutcracker. I've lived in Washington State my whole life, and traveling to Seattle for the Nutcracker at Christmas time is something I've gotten to do a few times in my life. As a child, it was a transformative experience, and the Maurice Sendak designs were all I knew. I was incredibly sad when I heard they were doing away with the Sendak version, but the current production is fabulous. It was so cool to hear you mention Pacific Northwest Ballet in the podcast, as I think they are doing some incredible things. One new thing this year is a sensory-friendly Nutcracker performance. Kelsey provided a link to a document about that. The other is the introduction of the green tea cricket character for the Chinese dance. They have been very intentional in their reworking of these dances, There are some pictures in this article, uh, and there's a link to a a story about the Nutcracker returning for the uh, the 2021 season with some of the the cricket pictures. I went down a rabbit hole looking for more about that cricket because that did seem amazing. Kelsey went on to say, I'm a band teacher now in a suburb of Seattle, and my students perform the Nutcracker Suite for our concert this Christmas, so I've been listening to it quite a lot. You may also enjoy this podcast podcast, which focuses on the music by Tchaikovsky. I have not listened to that podcast yet, uh, but I did go look at stuff about the sensory-friendly Nutcracker performance and the green tea cricket character for the Chinese dance. If anyone can hear a cat meowing in the background, that is my cat, (laughs) Onyx, who has struck up a new behavior called be as disruptive during recording as possible. Uh, Thank you so much, Kelsey, for sending this email. I tried to find uh, some video, maybe, of the, the new green tea cricket character in this ballet. And if uh, if they may put that on online sometime in the future, I don't know. I don't want to speak for them, but that's not there yet. But the pictures of it look so interesting. Um, and that has been done in conjunction with uh, an uh, organization that is just trying to, to move away from the anti-Asian stereotypes in ballet. So thank you so much, Kelsey, for sending this. Um, if you would like to send us a note, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com, and we're all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.